Okay. Do you want to go ahead and bow your heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the need of prayer and just, Father, thankful for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. And we just, uh, we're just so privileged, Father, to have you in our lives and the blessings that you give us. And Father, the peace that you place in our lives, even in the midst of the storm. Father, we ask that you open our hearts and minds and help us to receive the teaching that you would intend for us today. Help us to be blessed by the Bible study and the information that we're going to share. Uh, Father, help us to show honor and glory unto you by studying and learning your word and uh, just being honor and thankful, Father, for, for all that you've done for us. We uh, lift up those on our prayer list, Father. You know the needs of each and every person. And Father, we just ask that your will be done in their lives, Father, and that uh, you continue to bless and, and bring us all along and uh, help us to adjust our lives to the uh, to your your will, Father. Thank you for all that you do, Lord, and bless us and guide us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so my screen is a little messed up right now. <laughs> I was trying to uh, trying to put a picture on there, and let me see. It's it's showing. Uh, me and a picture of me, but to me it looks like you said you need very ghostly. Uh, it would be nice if that was wholly ghostly, but it's not really that. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna hide myself here. Uh, Junie, I can't hear your voice, so you're faded out again. Oh, I was muted. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, so we can go ahead and begin. So our study is called the Apostolic Authority of Paul. And uh, some of us have the books, some of us don't. Uh, I've just ordered some, so there'll be more in just two days here. We'll have more copies. But we're going to go through the introduction. And I'm going to read the introduction. I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty decent. Uh, the dedication is to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be our goal in all that we do especially for our study here. So I'm going to begin reading the introduction itself. It says, the goal of this work in seeking to honor God through our Lord Jesus Christ is an ambitious one. First and foremost, as the title states, I will examine the apostolic authority of Paul. So we're talking about Paul's apostleship and the authority that comes with that apostleship. So it says, I will examine the apostolic authority of Paul and this so that certain answers come sharply into focus. For example, who is Paul and why is he important? So important that without his writings, his 13 letters, namely Romans to Philemon, we would never have heard the expression the body of Christ. We would never have heard of nor understood in any biblical construct the expression, the revelation of the mystery. Nor would we know anything of salvation by grace alone, secured through the faith of Jesus Christ alone, without the addition of any human works, including repentance and water baptism. Without Paul, there would be no record, no complete record of God's judgment of Israel and the temporary suspension of their kingdom, their kingdom program, which resulted after the stoning of Stephen. Without Paul, we would know nothing of the one baptism in Ephesians chapter four, uh, or what's mentioned in uh, First Corinthians, we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that has for the body of Christ and in this time frame penned by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, what is called the but now, right? And the displacing of all other baptisms in times past. Without Paul, 
we would not know that we are complete in him. As Paul puts it in his letter to the Colossians, without the letters God, the Holy Spirit wrote through Paul, we would know nothing of our eternal security that is outlined in Romans chapter eight. We would know nothing of our election to privileges in Christ and our predestination in Christ, nor would we understand our parenthetical position between the Old and New Testaments. By parenthetical, I'm referring to the parentheses. We are inside the parentheses. The Old Covenant is to the left. The New Covenant is to the right. We are sandwiched in the middle. We don't belong to the Old Covenant. We don't belong to the New Covenant. We are in the middle of both with no covenant at all. Without Paul, we would be ignorant of our unique hope our unique inheritance, our unique relationship to God through Christ. Without Paul, we would not have heard the preaching of the cross, the gospel of the grace of God, or even how this gospel differs from the gospel of God or the gospel of the circumcision or the gospel of the kingdom. Without Paul, we would not yet understand the difference between the little flock of believers who were baptized, partook of the Lord's Supper, who spoke in tongues at, and after Pentecost as assigned to unbelieving Israel, who sought salvation under the law of Moses and the rules attending, hoping for entrance into the theocratic Davidic kingdom destined to be established upon the earth. Understanding who Paul is and what it was that God chose him to do is equally important. The Bible is very deep and complex and yet, with the help of God the Holy Spirit and much study and diligent effort on our part, we can begin to discover the revealed treasures that await the serious believer who will dig to find them. The facts become self-evident when we compare scripture with scripture, testing all things, and we reap the benefits that attend edification, especially of the body of Christ. Naturally, the question arises, what authority did Paul have? And what was the extent of his authority? Who did Paul have authority over? These are great questions. All of this and more we hope to cover in clear and easy to understand language. Not everything contained in this work will be considered the traditional view. And for that, I offer no apology. And I say this because in the 44 years, actually 45 now, that I have walked with God in Christ, I've noted, I've noticed that the vain traditions of men depart from scripture, and in doing so, blind all those who embrace unsound teaching. With much repetition and mishandling of the Bible, too many believers suffer from being mistaught, and when confronted with accurate exposition, too often resist the presentation of the truth. They don't want to hear it. This book will be helpful if the reader can keep an open mind and also look at the Bible, King James Bible, with fresh and unbiased eyes. So that's what we're asking people who are, who are going to check out the study. Please leave your bias and your prejudice at the door. Keep an open mind. Be willing to listen to the information and the arguments that we put forth, because we're going we're gonna to demonstrate from the scripture everything that we say. Everything that we say, we're going to back it up with scripture, rightly divided, put in its proper context. We're going to do that, and we're going to use scripture all throughout, of course. So that is the, the introduction. So let's go back and let's dissect this a little bit. Right? So we talked about the goal of the book. We've mentioned... The fact that Paul wrote 13 letters, Romans to Philemon. And we're going to have a lot more to say about Paul's 
the actual penning of these books and when they were written and so forth. Now, probably one of the most, I think, important statements that we make here in the introduction is the fact that without Paul, the, the expression, the body of Christ would be, would not be found throughout scripture. The only person, the first person, the last person, the only person in the Bible, in his writing, to use this expression, the body of Christ, is Paul. Now, people like to ignore that fact if they even think about it or recognize it. And they're quick to say, oh, the church, the body of Christ began at, in the book of Acts in chapter 2 long before Paul was saved. We know that's false. What began in Acts chapter 2? Can anyone tell me? What took place in Acts chapter 2? Was that, was that the birthday of the church, the body of Christ? Does the Bible teach that? No. no. Absolutely. No. It doesn't. No, that was the, uh, the formation of the, uh, pretty much of the little flock. That's a little flock. That, right, there is some kind of a change there because the Holy Spirit's being poured out. Jesus made that promise to them. He told them to wait in Jerusalem, don't leave, wait for the wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, he made post-resurrection appearances, right? He was seen by more than 500 people. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. He certainly appeared to the apostles. And then since doubting Thomas wasn't there when he made that appearance, that one appearance, Jesus shows up again later and says to him, touch my, touch my side and the whole prints in my hands and feet. And stop doubting and believe, right? So he, Jesus hangs out for 40 days before he ascends up into the heavens. And when he returns, he'll be coming back the same way he left on the clouds with the angels. That's how he's going to return, same way he left. So he tells them to wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He tells them they're going to have power when this happens. Power to witness, power to share the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom gospel. So this is important. Uh, Junie, you have the book already, don't you? I'm pretty sure we gave you a copy. You got one of the first copies that came out, right? Hello, uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do have a copy of the book. I don't have it with me right now. I'm trying to find it. But it's, okay. uh, yes, it is someplace in the house. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really not able to read anyway. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. With your, with your disability, that's true. Okay. Well, let's keep going then. I'm just saying that in case I have to dart out here for a minute. I thought Junie could jump in and cover me. I've been a little under the weather here today. Um, and I'm hoping I can get through the whole study here today. Okay, so anyways, we know that Acts chapter 2 is not the body of Christ. The only person in the entire Bible who uses that expression is Paul. The only places we even see it mentioned is in Paul's writing. Paul's the first to use it. He's the last to use it. He's the only person to use it. No other writer. Peter does not write to the body of Christ. We don't even see Peter use the expression the body of Christ. Peter wrote two books. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Now in the book of Acts, we have the history, how Paul got saved, right, on the road to Damascus, when Paul was commissioned and so forth. Luke just records information regarding Paul. But I challenge you to find the expression, the body of Christ in the book of Acts. It's not there. Luke does not use the expression, the body of Christ. He uses the word Gentiles, right? Refers to Gentiles, of course, in his writing. Gentiles are referred to. Some of those Gentiles became members of the body of Christ. But we don't, we don't see anybody except for Paul using that terminology. We don't see anybody but Paul writing to the body of Christ giving doctrine, giving instructions to the body of Christ. 
No one but Paul does that, Paul and Paul alone. So if we don't have Paul, we don't have, we don't know who we are. We don't know that we're in Christ. We don't have any information about how to be saved because even the gospel of the grace of God is found in Paul and Paul alone. Paul answers that age old question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved, right? And, and if it's Peter talking, he says, repent and be baptized and have your sins washed away, Acts 2.38. And in the, book of Luke, in the book of Luke, where the jailer is about to kill himself and Paul tells him, stop, don't do it. Paul, Paul, Paul speaking, not Luke, but Paul speaking, does talk about how to be saved. You and your household, if they, believe, they too will be saved. So as far as this gospel, gospel of the grace of God, which Paul got that information, and, and we know Paul, the change in Paul's ministry in the prison epistles, where he gets the gospel of the grace of God, the revelation of the mystery, more in-depth information, we should say, in Colossians, the fact that Christ is in us and we're in him, right? talks about set your affections on things which are above, not on things on the earth. So here we are, we spend so much energy and so much time working and we have to work. If you don't work, you don't eat, right? You, you have to work. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of our families and provide for them. These are normal things. We're not suggesting for a, for a minute that we don't do that. But what is, what is your passion in life? Our passion in life, according to Paul, and what we learn in Paul's writing, and without Paul, we would not know, that our, our, our heart, our love is to be attached to Christ, and, and we're to love his appearing. Now, why would we be so excited about Christ's appearing that's mentioned in Colossians 3, 4? Do we know why we should be excited? Why he says you're blessed if you if you if you love his appearing and his coming. Well, his appearing is uh, our exit from <laughs> from oh. this troublesome world. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All our all our troubles are gone the day he shows up. Right when he shows up, we get a resurrection body. We put away corruption at that point. We put on incorruption, we, we put off mortality, and we put on immortality. All those things occur, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, when Christ appears. And it says when he appears, we're going to appear with him in glory. That information is directed to the body of Christ. You're not going to find that information in Peter. You're not going to find that information in the Gospel of John or Mark or Luke. Not in the book of Acts, not in the Gospel of Luke. You're only going to find that information in Paul's writing. And since that's Colossians, that's one of the prison epistles. Paul calls himself the prisoner of the Lord. If we don't recognize what God has done in Paul, we will not recognize what God is doing today. Now, most believers today are in a state of tremendous confusion. They teach that the church was born on the day of Pentecost. I've heard so many sermons, I, I can't bear to listen to it anymore, where they, where they talk about going back to Pentecost. They want to go back to the book of Acts. Book of Acts is transitional. Transitioning from Israel's program, which has been shut down, we wouldn't know the full of that without Paul's writing, by the way. We're talking about why is Paul so important for those of you who are just jumping on. We're in the, we're, we are in the introduction of the apostolic authority of Paul, our new book that we're studying that is dealing with Paul, Paul's ministry, the authority that Paul had as an apostle. And we're going to notice Paul's apostleship and the authority that was that went with that 
fact, it was a little different than the 12. Paul was not one of the 12. People love to say that. They don't understand that Paul is different. There aren't 13 apostles for the nation of Israel. 12 is the number of government. Israel had 12 apostles when Judas committed suicide and, and went to the place of his own. That's how the scripture describes it, right? He went into his own place, which is the grave for now until the resurrection and he's judged. This information regarding Paul is so important because he's not one of the 12. And if you make him one of the 12, you erase everything that we just covered. The fact that there is such a thing as the body of Christ, that we're not the nation of Israel, that we're not under law, we're under grace. And as we go through our study, we're going to see that Paul was under tremendous attack. He was under attack by his own kinsmen, the Jewish people. And Paul isn't speaking against the law to people who are under the law. He talked about the true nature of the law and the true purpose of the law. And he talked about the fact that Gentiles were never given the law and are not under the law. So you have to stop and ask yourself a question. Why are so many people trying to keep the law today? Why do so many churches teach that? Even though they'll come right out and say, oh, you're not under the law. But they get signs all over the building telling you to pay your tithes and offerings. Tithing is under the law. If, if they really understood that you're not under the law and believe that, why do they keep trying to teach you how to speak in tongues? We covered that already. We've covered that many, many times. In, in our last study, The Little Flock, we also covered speaking in tongues and, and the rules that pertain to speaking in tongues and how that whenever they spoke in tongues, it was for the benefit of a Jewish unbeliever. It was a witness. We, Paul says, wherefore tongues are for a sign. First Corinthians chapter 14, I believe it's verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. And Paul goes on to say the law. He says, it's written in the law. With men of other tongues will I speak to this nation, the nation Israel. Tongues were a sign for the nation Israel, right? So why are people pushing tongues today? You know, tongues were silent for about 1900 years. It's been less than about 100 years now. There's been a revival of speaking in tongues, right? It was, it was something that the cults practiced for quite a while. But the body of Christ has fallen into deep deception and now they're speaking in tongues. We've got lots of churches, lots of denominations pushing the tongues thing. And uh, they call it the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, we've, we've covered that at length. We don't need to belabor that point. But uh, our lesson today is dealing with the fact, and we're just going through our introduction here, all the things that we wouldn't know, that we need to know, just to even understand the difference between who and what we are and God's dealing with us and who and what the nation of Israel is and was and God's dealing with them and why it's so important to be able to rightly divide scripture, understanding both theirs, what's written to them, and ours, that which is written to us. Because what was written to them doesn't match our program. What was written to us would be, in, would be in stark contrast to what was given and written to them. You can't combine or commingle those two things. So as you're reading your Bible and Paul's letters especially, you have to recognize, and we're going to go through this in depth, the audience, the fact that he's talking to the body of Christ in some places like Ephesians and Colossians and 2 Timothy and other places like in Romans 9 through 11, for example, the Lord's Supper, right? 
uh, this information regarding speaking in tongues even, and a few other places, a handful of other places, where he is most certainly not talking to the body of Christ. No member of the body of Christ can eat and drink damnation unto themselves, as he mentioned, with regard to eating the Lord's Supper without properly discerning the body, Christ, Christ's body. And there he's not talking about the body of Christ, he just says Christ's body. He's talking about Christ's body and not discerning it in, in that remembrance in which they were participating. So this is incredibly important that we understand these distinctions. Now I'm at the top of page two here. And as I'm going through this list of things which we would not know without Paul, one of the most important things we wouldn't understand would be what actually occurred at the cross because Paul is the one who preached the cross. When Peter preached the cross, he slammed Israel. He said, you killed the son of the son of God, the son of life, right? He, he accused them of what they did. He, he's, he's, he's judge and jury there, right? Convicting Israel of their sin of crucifying their own Messiah. Paul glories in the cross. He glories in it. Well, while Peter's attacking them because of it, Paul is glorying in the cross because without the cross, we'd have nothing. Without that crucifixion, we'd have nothing. And in Colossians, what does Paul say? He says, we are complete in him. If you recognize the fact that you're complete in Christ, what should you do? What should you do? You, you should cease from working. You should cease from your labor. You, you should retire from sin. Is there anybody here that would like to be retired? Uh, yeah. Uh, my yeah. Well. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. We're retired complete. from sin. Yeah, retired from sin. We're we're completely well, we're retired from sin. Yeah. We're, 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 we're retired. Well, we're forgiven for sins. We are forgiven. We are cleansed. Sin is never mentioned again. It's never brought up again. It's never held against you again. And the fact that you're complete in him means that you are as holy as you're ever going to be. <laughs> you're as clean in God's eyesight as you're ever going to be because of what Christ has done. So you can, when he talks about ceasing from your labors, stop trying to make yourself holy. You should walk in that holiness. We don't sin hoping that the grace of god is going to abound towards us right it's not a license people love to say that oh you're 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 teaching you're preaching that there's we have a license to sin no i'm teaching that you're retired from sin i'm teaching that sin hath no more dominion over you it has no more rule and reign over you that's what we're teaching and we only know that because of what paul has written and since we are complete in him, we're not missing anything. We're not lacking anything. And there's nothing we could do with the energy of the flesh to please God in the first place. I like the way Juni puts it. He says, you can't maintain, but you could never obtain on your own. Christ has done all the work. Christ gets all the credit. So since he gets all the credit, why are people trying so hard to get some credit? It doesn't belong to you. You can't take credit for anything, right? You can't. You can't even take credit for believing. You heard the gospel. You instantly believe what you heard because it's true and you're not insane, right? You, you heard the gospel, you believe the gospel and God did all the work. He saved you, right? You, you believed with the faith of Jesus Christ. And you are eternally saved that very second. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit the second you heard and believed the gospel. That's how it worked. So quick, so fast, you didn't know what hit you. And it may have been days or weeks or months later, sometimes years for some folks, before you even half understood what really took place the day, the moment, the instant that you believed in Christ. Now, on page two, we've also mentioned without Paul, 
we wouldn't understand the difference between the gospel of the grace of God, that's the gospel Paul preached, and the difference between the other gospels that are mentioned. Paul also preached what's called the gospel of God. And we've explained that, right? Paul preached the very faith that he once tried to destroy in the little flock. So he, he preached and said, it's true. Christ is the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. He did die on the cross. He, he was buried. And three days later, he rose from the dead. That's true. Paul used to hate that information. Paul you remember that's that's the information that was being shared by Stephen and when Paul's holding the coats. Right, exactly. Now the very thing that he hated and that he spoke against and he was throwing people into prison for, that very thing, now he is confirming that that information is true. He had, a, he had a ministry confirming those things, saying Jesus is the Christ. He is Israel's Messiah. Well, and as I was going to say, he's only confirming that to Israel because Israel is the only one who received that message. Right. They're, they're the only ones that heard it. They were the ones who were supposed to believe it and accept it. And Paul previously was attacking them for that very information, for that very faith, that very belief. And now here's Paul coming full circle, coming back to some of those same folks saying he was wrong and acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ. And when he was on trial and before Festus and others, what did he say? He recounts how he got saved on the day on the road to Damascus, how the Lord Jesus reached out to him and spoke to him. And, and what was Paul to do? Was Paul to argue with the Lord himself? On the road there, he was blinded, by the way. God got his attention. Isn't it interesting that you're, you're spiritually blind before you're saved? And some people are willfully blind. They don't want to know. You've told them. I had one student who uh, I remember witnessing to this student, uh, a graduate student of mine who came in. Her name is Star and uh, was helping me proctor a final exam. I had a, a very large class. I don't remember how many kids were in that class, maybe 120 students. And uh, they were taking their exam and I had helpers. And one of the helpers I had was one of my students named Star. And I witnessed, that was like, a, I forget how long, I think they had two hours to take the exam. I don't remember the exact time, but it was a long time they had to take the test. And the entire time we got to talking and I started witnessing and witnessed just about that whole time, got up periodically, walked around, checked the students, but sat back down and just kept witnessing, witnessing, witnessing. <clears throat> and my student was rejecting Christ, rejecting the gospel, didn't really want to hear it. I could see her squirming in her seat. She was very uncomfortable, but I just kept sharing the gospel because that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's my joy to do that. And now I'm back in the United States since, let me see, since 2016, here it is, 2021. So I'm back, what, five years now? And, uh, and even less than that, maybe it was a year or so ago, that student wrote to me and said, I'm, I believe what you were telling me back then about Christ. She said, I, I was intentionally resisting God even though I knew it was what you were saying is true. So I was very happy to hear that, that the student accepts, accepted Christ, believed in the death, burial, resurrection, and is a believer. I was really stunned. It's, it's so amazing when God saves people, and especially when you're witnessing to someone and you think, oh, they're not listening. You can, you can almost see the tug of war, spiritual, the spiritual battle that's going on, because you're telling them, absolute truth and it's the most important thing you can share with someone the most important thing and uh it's a little frustrating sometimes when you're sharing with people uh like junie you just had lunch with eric i don't know how many times we've witnessed to eric right and and you can get you can get frustrated sometimes because people aren't they appear not to be listening but it's interesting that Sometimes it's nothing more than planting a seed. 
or watering a seed that somebody else planted. And then God, God for he, God to get the glory. God gets the glory and God gives the increase. Now, we wouldn't even have the gospel to share this, this information with people without understanding Pauline truth. Someone put uh, on the internet, on Facebook, um, and it's a group that rightly divides the word. This is a group of folks who believe in right division, who understand 2 Timothy 2.15. It's a Bible group, and I'm part of this group, and periodically I'll jump in there and you know, respond to a question or make a comment or something. Someone asked a question, and I don't like to uh, zero in on specific ministers and all that, but someone zeroed in on John MacArthur, and they wanted to know, uh, is this someone who is in agreement with what we're teaching? Now, some things he's very good with. He certainly believes in the deity of Christ, uh, the, the Godhead. There's some basic fundamental things he would be very good on, right? But there are other things he would not be good on. And they were asking, what are those things in which we disagree? So some of the things that we've mentioned here in our opening, in our introduction, are things which the church that does not know right division, and John MacArthur would fall into this category, they reject right division, they reject the revelation of the mystery, they reject dispensations, they reject all these things which would prevent you, if you reject them that is, from coming to a very sound understanding of the gospel and the word of God. And there's so many that are on radio and television uh, we don't we don't generally tell people don't listen to anybody but us, right? And thank God there's other people out there, especially on the internet now, who are teaching right division. So we're very happy about that, and we want to support the, those ministries and those individuals who are preaching the revelation of the mystery. Our commission is Ephesians chapter three verse nine. In Paul's letter, what does he say? He says, "Making all men see." What is the revelation of the mystery? If you do not understand the revelation of the mystery, you're going to be very hit and miss with the gospel. And, and in John MacArthur's preaching, he's, he's done some sermons called the gospel according to Jesus. As if that gospel is the gospel that saves us today, and it is not, right? The gospel according to Peter. Well, Peter's gospel isn't directed at the body of Christ. Peter never wrote to the body of Christ. Never. We have, we have no verses in scripture written by Peter that are directed to the body of Christ. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is open up chapter one of, of Peter's letters and look and see to whom he's writing. He's writing to the Jews, he tells you so, that are scattered, that are dispersed from Jerusalem. He's writing his letter telling them these are these his letters by the way are going to apply to tribulation saints that's true of the book of hebrews we don't know who the writer is could be timothy or someone else we don't know we do know it's not paul as paul said i sign all of my letters he didn't sign hebrews and people who don't rightly divide don't understand that hebrews deals with times past and it uses that expression times past right in there in that first chapter, I think it is. He also, it also deals with the ages to come with regard to the tribulation period. It deals with the tribulation period. It's not dealing with the but now. When you read the book of Hebrews, the but now has already taken place. The rapture of the church has already occurred. And without right division, I was listening to, I think it was on the internet, some minister who, who's mentioning the body of Christ in the book of Revelation. And I kind of chuckled when I heard that. I said, because John the Apostle who wrote the book of Revelation did not write to the church, does not mention the body of Christ anywhere. That expression's not found there. And when he's talking about the removal, he's talking about 
the nation of Israel. He's not, re he's not referring to the body of Christ. Only Paul discusses doctrinal teaching that applies to the body of Christ. Paul and Paul alone. I remember a pastor here in Syracuse asked the question, where is the body of Christ found in, in the book of Revelation? Which, which one of the seven churches? And uh, <laughs> obviously he wasn't a right divider. No, uh, but wrong, if, wrong, if, que wrong question, right? Yeah, well, well, no, right question. The answer is nowhere. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because, yeah. And, and if you look at the address to the seven churches, it's very Jewish. Uh, uh, it's very Jewish. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very it's, it's, Jewish um, vocabulary. That's what right. They're, they're synagogues. Very Jewish vocabulary. They're synagogues. Yep. Yeah. He writes. He writes to believers at Smyrna and, and uh, uh, Laodicea and and so forth. Pergamos. Pergamos, and Thyatira, Sardis, all these Jewish assemblies. That's what they were, Jewish assemblies. And, and the language that he uses all throughout the book of Revelation lets you know. He talks about those who kept the law, the law keepers, right? He talks about them as overcomers. We're not described as overcomers. We are called more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, what's the difference between an overcomer and more than a conqueror? Well, an overcomer is somebody who got through the tribulation period. <laughs> Reminds me of that song uh, Mahala Jackson used to sing. My, my mom and dad used to listen to uh, some beautiful uh, black gospel music. And... Uh, not, uh, not that quite a bit of that was doctrinally sound, but uh, I remember one song which I enjoyed as a child and, and even now by Mahala Jackson and she sings about how she got over, how she became an overcomer. And, and when they walk the streets of gold in the new Jerusalem, which of course she won't be there, if she's a saved person, she'll be with you and I as members of the body of Christ in heaven, our kingdom is not an earthly kingdom, right? We're not coming back to inhabit the earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter three, I think it's verse 20, where he talks about the Polituma metaphor. Our, our citizenship is in heaven. We're not going to be returning to the earth to set up the kingdom here on earth that has the meek shall inherit the earth. That's the nation of Israel, right? So John isn't dealing with the body of Christ. Absolutely not. The revelation of the mystery was not given to John or Peter or, or Andrew or James or any, or any of the rest of them. And anybody writing in their writing is not addressing the body of Christ except for Paul. And because Paul is an able minister of the New Testament and God, God in Paul's commission, he mentions you're going you're gonna to witness to kings, to the children of Israel. That's the expression he uses. We know over 600 times he calls Israel children, right? Look at John's writing, my dear little children. Look how he speaks to the nation of Israel. He calls them children. You and I, we learn this in Paul, are adults and God gives us admonitions, speaks to us as an adult. So when we look at Paul's authority, we're gonna look at how Paul speaks to us, how Paul treats us, and also how Paul speaks to the nation of Israel using his authority as an apostle. And I think some of the information is going to be a little shocking to you. And we're going to read it right out of the scripture. And it's going to make sense when we rightly divide. When we don't rightly divide, it doesn't make sense. You struggle with scripture sometimes and something does, doesn't come together. 
if you rightly divide scripture with that verse that you're confused on, many times the light will shine brightly and you'll, you, you'll come to an understanding. Really, it will shine brightly. That's, that's true with controversial topics like speaking in tongues, like, like women in ministry. I remember my, when my wife and I first got married, she, she wanted to know how I felt about, can a woman be a Bible teacher? Can she preach a, a message? I said, yes, of course she can. Well, she had heard from other churches and these denominations and stuff that a woman has to keep her mouth shut. She has to be silent in church. If she has any questions, she can go ask her husband when she gets home. Of course, we have a lot of women in church who don't have a husband and don't have anybody to ask when she gets home. <laughs> but uh, we learn when we rightly divide Paul's writing that that information is addressed to Israel, women under the law. And it, be it became clear to us that that is the case because we read that verse in its proper context. We kept on reading. We didn't stop with the prohibition. We read the verses before that. We read the verses immediately after that. What did we see? We saw in Paul's writing that he is absolutely speaking to the nation Israel, and that was an agrarian society, right? They were farmers. They they were sh sheep herders. And the woman stayed at home and raised the family, raised the children. And they had a lot of children back then. And her primary role was to be a keeper at home. Now, we had some women who had businesses. We see that with uh, Lydia and other women who are mentioned in the Bible who had their own business, who are entrepreneurs, right? They're not criticized. They're not braced for that. No, absolutely not. So... If we're going to rightly divide the word, and we must, we've been instructed to do so, we're going to continue to do this as we study the apostolic authority of Paul. What sets Paul apart as different? What special gifts did Paul have as an apostle? Did he differ from the other apostles? We're going to answer all these questions. What authority did God give to Paul that was different and distinct from Peter? Did Peter have more, did Paul have more authority to, than Peter? Is there anywhere in scripture, I'm going to ask a couple of questions because I want you to think about this. Is there anywhere in scripture where we see Paul bracing Peter, correcting Peter, and vice versa? Is there any place in scripture where we see Peter correcting Paul, bracing Paul publicly or privately? Do we see that anywhere in scripture? Think about that. And when we meet back next week, let's talk about that. Next week, we're going we're gonna to look at the background. We just went through our introduction today. Next time, we'll begin on page four with the background. It'll probably take us a couple of weeks to go through the background. Starts on page four. Let's see where it ends. It ends on page 45. So we're going to go from 4 to 45. This, this chapter that we're going to begin with is 41 pages long. It's very lengthy. And there's a lot of information in there. It's going to take us a few weeks, a couple of weeks to get through that section. So if you have the book, go ahead and read those 41 pages for next week. And we'll take our time, we'll go through it, we'll answer questions, and, uh, and uh, we'll hope to get some great comments as well. Do we have any questions, comments? Okay, we're done for today. Let's quickly close with a word of prayer. Father, we do praise and thank you for every opportunity that you give us to study your word together corporately and even privately, Lord. Uh, every blessing that we have, we recognize it's courtesy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every breath we draw, every time we open our eyes and we're able to see and stand up and walk or 
talk or hear, and just even to draw in a breath. We don't take these things for granted. We just want to offer you all the praise and the honor and the glory that you're worthy of, Lord. And uh, we hope and pray that we can meet again next week. Uh, unless you're coming to get us before then. And Lord, we have no complaints there. We praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.